days on the rolling ocean. Bert was a really invigorating speaker for Kisilano Business Leaders Meetup back in August 2016. So it's fantastic having him join us again. And in besides being a sailor that has become the first North American to solo circumnavigate the world using only traditional navigation tools, no GPS, none of the fancy stuff, just pen and pencil. And uh, just to show how hard it is, he is only the eighth person in the world to achieve this accomplishment. When he's not sailing on the ocean blue, he helps businesses leverage online tele footprint for the healthcare space. And he does this for a very select group. So let's bring on Bert to heart to talk about how all of us can move from ordinary to extraordinary and unleash our massive potential. Welcome, Bert. Bert, are you there? Yep, yep. I'm wonderful. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, so uh, let me just share my screen here. All right, so that should be it. Um, just, I just want to make sure that's. Uh, are we good? To, are we good to go there, Roger? Will you see what I'm seeing? Yes, we are. We're all good. Fire away. Okay, so uh, firstly, I have to apologize for Sea Billy Bird. I, I I knocked my tooth out um, during the trip, so uh, and I actually spit it out again on the customs dock when I was clearing back into Canada. So war wound. Um, yeah, it's a war wound. You've got you've you've got. Uh, you've got the, the real pirate sort of in the house, as it were. Um, <laughs> uh, and I also want to say that all the pictures in this presentation, I wasn't going to mention this, but um, uh, Simon sort of said, kind of had a, a comment about it. So all the pictures that you see here, I took on board. They're, they're all part of the, they're all part of this trip. Um, so I guess uh, to begin with, I want to say thank you to both, uh, to both Judy and Roger for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to the group, it's it's a really it's a real thrill, and it's a and it's an honor, and it's a privilege that I that I don't take lightly, or um, or take for granted. So I want to extend uh, a, a deep and heartfelt thank you for the uh, for, for for the invite. It really means a lot. And, and to be honest, um, this is the first talk I've, I've put off giving a talk about this trip to any other group. So you guys are the first, and I and I and I did that on purpose. Um, and I, I also want to talk uh, very, very briefly about the 600 pound gorilla in the room. And that is if you actually want to achieve anything of real, uh, anything of real substance, if you actually want to um, uh, really connect with your goals, then the first thing to do is to reach out to your network. And I know for a fact that if I, that if I were to reach out to Judy or, or, or Roger, they would, they would, they would, they would, they would um, do anything in their power to, to, to get me pointed in, in the, in, in the right direction. And if you don't believe that in this room, then I would suggest humbly that you're in the wrong place. So again, I want to say thank you to, uh, to Judy and, uh, uh, and Roger. So um, really, let's get started. So what I want to do and what I really want to focus on today is what it takes to unleash the massive potential that's really lurking in each and every one of you. And, and I don't that this is not going to be a talk that you're um, that you're typically familiar with. I think this is going to be a little bit different because um, perhaps after the 265 days of of introspection, um, I've I've been able to I think at least distill a few things down to just to, to their to their single most relevant core. So. Um, what we're really talking about when we're talking about potential are our limits and what you perceive as your limits. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about how to professionally and ethically push your limits to their to their max. And I, that's that's the end goal and 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 that's the end game. And this is not going to be I can assure you this is not going to be about uh, uh, a long list of cliche slogans or or virtual high fives. 
what I want to talk about is what you can do when the chips are down. And when I mean down, I mean you're looking at um, and you're, you're looking at something that's deadly serious. And when I mean deadly serious, I mean exactly that. Um, I'm gonna, you need a method that's absolutely, totally bomb proof and brain dead simple. If you're gonna use that system to move your life forward when it really, really matters, when you have to make a decision that really, really matters. And like I said, sometimes those decisions in my case had to do with whether or not you're gonna live in the next half hour or not. And I, and I don't mean that, I mean that literally not figuratively. So let's get started. Um, the question you should be asking yourself, and I mean this seriously, is who am I? Like, why should you actually listen to what I'm going to say today? Um, and probably more importantly, why should you care? If you're not asking these questions, I think you probably, I think you should be because um, your time is really precious. Um, my time is really precious. And it's way too easy to blow way too much time on things that aren't important, at least aren't, aren't important in the context of moving you forward. So um, maybe here's why you should listen to me. Um, uh, what I'm going to what I'm going to focus on today is uh, the the trip, the solo nonstop circumnavigation around the world via the five great capes. But as a as an entrepreneur, I've I've made and lost and made fortunes again. I mean that's the entrepreneur in me. I I love that. I love that particular challenge, and I love the ups and downs. Whether um, the ups and downs are just are just part of the ride. And if you can't if you can't uh, if you can't stomach the ride, then you're in the wrong business. But but and, and over and above being um, an entrepreneur, my actual um, academic training is in is in physics and physical oceanography and I, I love science I love the oceans and I'm really proud of, of, of what I've contributed in those areas but like I said my focus today is going to be on the recent circumnavigation and the other things that I've accomplished in my life are um, are relevant but they're not the focus of, um, of, 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 of the core they're not at the core of, of what I want to speak to you today they're, they're realizations um, of, of they're, they're a manifestation of, of realizing potential, but they're not necessarily core to what I'm going to talk about today. The circumnavigation is something something else, absolutely and totally, um, entirely. I mean, why? You might ask yourself, what does a mind-bending, you know, crazy-ass, near-suicidal attempt at getting around the world by yourself have to do with with uh, with business? And um, one of the things that that it's incredibly difficult. A solo nonstop circumnavigation is unbelievably, almost, almost, almost imaginably hard. And in some ways, um, getting over the hump as an entrepreneur or getting over the hump as, as, as a businessman, whatever that hump might be, sometimes it's small, sometimes, of course, it's, it's, it's massive. But um, that has a lot in common with doing something that can be really, really difficult. So how hard is it? Like, how, how difficult is it? Is it exactly? Well, let me give you just a little bit of perspective. Um, about 6,000 people have summited Everest. About 600 people have been into space. About 300 people have sailed around the world nonstop, like I did. And about nine people, uh, Judy said eight, but um, there's, I found another one, so I'm the ninth person to do it. Nine people have sailed around the world nonstop using only traditional navigational tools as composed, as compared to 6,000 people who've been to the top of Everest. And even more difficult perhaps than sailing around the world nonstop using traditional navigational tools is sailing around the world nonstop leading from the North American coast. Only four people in the world have done that. Okay, so maybe, maybe you can't relate to, to this particular um, perspective. Maybe you're not, um, maybe, you know, maybe adventure isn't in your blood, so to speak, but maybe you can relate to this. This is a comparison of the number of millionaires and billionaires in the world. That's the, that's the graph in blue to millionaires and billionaires in Canada. That's the bar in orange. So if you just look at Canada, you have a 1.3 million times greater chance of becoming a millionaire than you do in succeeding in around the world nonstop circumnavigation. You actually have a 2100 chance, you have, you're a 2100 times more likely 
to become a billionaire than you are to sail nonstop, to, su to successfully sail nonstop around the world using only celestial navigation. That might give you some idea of how insanely difficult it actually is. And I mean, if, if, if I were to ask, I think off the top of your head, most people would think that becoming a billionaire is actually really, really hard. Well, it turns out that becoming a billionaire in this day and age is hard, but not anywhere near impossible. And it's not anywhere near as difficult as completing one of these trips. And I know that sounds a little, for, for, for sailors or people who aren't sort of familiar with, with actually what it takes or what, or I shouldn't say what it takes, that's, that's pretentious, but for, for people that really relate, it's almost impossible because um, firstly, it's so otherworldly. Um, one, of the, one of the ways to think about it is that the first person to do it, it did it in 1969. And that is the year that man walked on the moon. In 1969, it was considered every bit as difficult to sail around the world nonstop by yourself as it was to get to the moon and back. So it's not easy. And here's one of the reasons why it's not easy. That little white swiddle is my track around the world. It took 265 days. I sailed 28,880 nautical miles and I did it all alone. You can see by the track that you are, for the most part, thousands of miles away from land and fully two thirds of that trip is done in the world's most extreme marine environment. You do it in the Southern Ocean. The weather there is extreme. The waves are absolutely massive and the closest human to you is on the International Space Station. There is virtually no way that you can get rescued or you can get help. You are entirely and completely on your own. And the only thing between you and oblivion are the four inches between your ears. So um, and when I say oblivion, I can take one step. If I stand in the middle of the boat and take one step left or right, I step off the boat. And the worst thing that can happen is um, not actually leaving or or falling off the boat because you'll be dead in a matter of minutes, maybe 20. But if you injure yourself, if you injure yourself, you're, you're in a world of hurt, literally. So um, doing anything outside for those nine months means that you're crawling around on your hands and knees on the deck because otherwise you'll get tossed off the boat. Now, um, I spent, for example, I ate virtually every meal standing up because it's the only way to, that you can um, feed yourself because you need both hands. You have to have both hands free, one hand for a bowl and one hand for a spoon. And you need three points of contact. So you got to wedge yourself somewhere, somehow, where you can actually eat. And um, I, I slept, um, I never slept for more than two hours to, for, the, for the nine months that I was away, for two hours at a stretch. And I never slept for more than four hours in any one 24 hour stretch. You are on, you are, when I mean on, you are in 100% um, present, have to perform at your highest possible standard mentally, physically, and emotionally, or you're not going to make it for nine months straight, 24-7. It is an unrelenting, and it's an unrelenting exercise without reprieve. And you're literally under the gun from the moment you step on the boat to the moment you step off the boat. And the the mental and physical challenges that you face are beyond what the average person can normally endure. And what I want to talk about today is how you, how me, basically, as an average person, was able to actually get it done, as it were. How I, as a normal person, as an average sailor, I'm not one of the rock star professional sailors who are who are household names in Europe. I'm just an average guy with an average boat. I mean, I liken taking Suburban on this trip to taking an RV on the Paris to Dakar rally. It's, it's possible, but not, but not recommended. 
So, um, and this Kitsilano business, some of you guys have actually been on Suburban, so you know exactly, you know, what's there and, and, and what's not there. But the reason, the motivation to succeed um, and, to, and, and to persevere is, I think, is, is partly on this slide. Um, success resonates both, not just with you, but, but with everyone who's associated with you, both, both professionally and, and, uh, and personally. And I've, I've talked, the last time I actually spoke to, to, to Roger's uh, VPN group was about um, your story. So you can, and uh, you can never, ever, ever underest underestimate the value of your story to um, inspire, motivate, and connect. And, and it's not what you think. You, well, I shouldn't say it's not what you think, but it's not what I thought. The, your story will not only inspire um, and motivate potentially and likely others, but the, the feedback you get from those people who then reach out and connect to you is far more, far more inspirational and motivating than you could ever possibly imagine. So there's a positive feedback loop with, with, with sharing your story. And, and part of sharing your story is, of course, reaching for your goals. And reaching for your goals, no matter how big or small they are, is, is an attempt for you personally to rise, to rise above your own circumstance. And rising above your own circumstance, as trite as it might sound, is what heroes are made of. I'm not in any way, shape, or form identifying myself as a hero. Please don't, don't, don't get me wrong. But, but, but socially and in, and, in, and, and, and in storytelling and in, and in mythology, um, rising above circumstance is one of those things that, that is hardwired into the human psyche. It's something that we can all relate to. And it's one of the primary and fundamental reasons that you need to share your story because rising above your circumstance is, the, is, 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 what, is what reaching or, or, or reaching out for your goals is, is always about. And what I wanna talk about today, very, very specifically, is that how you can do something, something that is brain dead simple, something that is absolutely and totally foolproof that will allow you to rise above your circumstance, that will arouse you that will that will allow you to reach your goals. That will allow you to um, fall back onto something when you are literally in the worst possible place you you, you can imagine. And I'm not going to talk. There's this is not any hand. This is not hand waving stuff. I'm not. I'm going to tell you what you can do right here and now to ensure a better outcome. Absolutely guaranteed. No matter how how dire the situation is, um, whether it's personally or whether it's professionally, and this is, it's, it's bomb-proof and foolproof, and most importantly, it's simple. So you should remember this slide. This is the, this is the beginning slide. This is, the, this, is, this is what I'm gonna talk about. And there's four simple things that you can do that you can start doing immediately to achieve any goal that you have the courage to reach to reach out for. Now, and, and I mean courage quite literally. It takes a lot of courage, personal courage, to reach out beyond your comfort zone. And it, it, it takes an almost unimaginable amount of courage to reach beyond the comfort zone of most normal people on the planet. And remember, I am literally having, having the comfort zone, placing yourself in the middle of the ocean, thousands of miles from land, with no, with no hope of help, really, in a small boat in a vast ocean in the in the worst place the most extreme environment in the world is probably outside the comfort zone of most normal people so and it takes a bit of courage to do that so when i i mean quite literally in order to in order to reach your goals or set goals you there, there's a there's 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 a certain amount of courage that you have to come face to face with and um I, i've i've said I've used the word disruptor because disruptor is like change in my mind, and change is is synonymous with opportunity. And the more the more massive or the more disruptive the change, the greater the opportunity. Whether it's socially or whether economically, political, or even personally, disruptions are opportunities literally hiding in plain sight. And every goal that you set for yourself in your life is literally a change, and therefore a disruption, and therefore an opportunity. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna frame this as the disruptor ethos, and um, I'm sorry for the pretentious little jargon or slogan, but I, I couldn't contain myself. So there you go. That I'm gonna talk about what I've what I've called the disruptor ethos. So let's 
Let's get started. Now, there's four things that you must do. Here's the first one. You have to read more. Um, I'm sure that I mean, every entrepreneur I've ever, I've ever known, talked to, every businessman I, I, I've known or talked to, they're all, they're all pressed for time. But I will tell you that the most successful of those people are voracious readers. And you need to read, and I'm not talking about Facebook or Twitter or social media. I'm talking about real literature. I'm talking about um, the, it, it, I'm, I'm not, it can be anything that, I mean, Personally, I could give you a reading list that I, I would suggest that you start with, but that's not the point. You need to read in your field and you need to read um, the, the entire spectrum, what's going on academically and what's going, and, and, and what's going on, um, uh, um, what's going on professionally. And I think that th this is a lifelong pursuit. So if you're, I, I believe that you need to be reading virtually every single day um, in your field and in your primary passions and interests. And um, for example, when I left on my trip, I, I read every single book on single-handed, on, on, on every single single-handed voyage I could find. I read everything I could read about on the Southern Ocean. I read everything I could read about on, on, on weather patterns. I read everything I could read about, about the, the methodologies of using short form celestial navigation. I, I studied heavy weather tactics. I became a student of single-handed navigation and, and sailing. And um, that breadth of knowledge, when when the chips are down, comes to you in ways that you that that you can't possibly imagine. So let me give you an example of why I think reading is important. Now, um, my apologies to all the coaches in this room. I know there's 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 lots of you guys, but you can't blame me for this this particular quote. You can blame a certain Christia Freeland, who happens to be the deputy prime minister of Canada. Now, this is a this is from her book Plutocrats, which if you haven't read then uh, you should, and I'm not gonna say anything about it. So you're gonna sort of figure it out for yourself when you actually, uh, when you have some time. But Plutocrats is a, it's a phenomenal book. Um, Christia Freeland is a phenomenal um, journalist. And um, um, what, what, what she said here about Drucker is, is, in, is important as it, because Drucker some 50 years ago, five decades ago, predicted the rise of the knowledge worker. So he, he realized that there was gonna be some tension between capital and some tension between knowledge. And his realization and his, he was the, he was the, the bell ringer or the harb, harbinger of the, the phenomenal and exponential rise in sea level suite um, executive paychecks. In the last, prior to somewhere around 60 years ago, the, the super rich people in the world, the wealthiest people in the world, got there because of capital. They owned, they owned land, they owned factories, they owned, um, they, they owned physical things, they owned capital assets. Today, the super rich got there primarily because they're wage earners. Like how is it that, for example, a CEO can make 50, 60, 70 million dollars a year and when they leave, make even more? That is, that is wealth beyond imagining um, some 50 years ago. How is it that, for example, Ellen DeGeneres can make something in the order of 50 plus million dollars a year? It's because of we live in the information age. We live in the age of the knowledge worker. Drucker, some 50 years ago, predicted that this is the way that free markets were going to go. And you can, and I picked Drucker because one, it's in this book. I think you should read this book. And secondly, this is 50 years ago. And it's, it pertains, it's really, really important to us because not only did, did Drucker predict the change in knowledge from the, 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 the tension or the, 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 the conflict between knowledge and capital, he also predicted the rise of the, um, the, rise, of the, the rise of the globalization of talent, which you, you and I might know as outsourcing. So that was 50 years ago. So imagine if you had a 50 year head start on what, what you know today, you would be massively wealthy as those people who jumped on that particular bandwagon were. So what I'm, what I'm talking about reading, this is the stuff, um, this is an example of how it can stand you in better stead. So beyond reading, you have to leverage your story. So never under, underestimate the power of your own journey to inspire, motivate, and connect with the audience the world over. So um, that why it's, there's number. There's a number of different. There's a number of different 
reasons for that. But let me give you some, let me give you some, some examples um, that you can probably relate to. Um, most importantly, your connections and your exposure will help you recognize when it's time as an entrepreneur to pivot. And, and again, some examples. Odeo was a podcasting um, startup that failed, but from Podio or Odeo, I'm sorry, grew a small company you might know as uh, Twitter. They pivoted when they realized from feedback from their tribe that they were in the wrong space. Now, Reed Hoffman started, maybe you know who Reed Hoffman is, maybe you don't. Reed Hoffman started a, started a, a, a tech startup called socialnet.com. It failed, but his exposure to his tribe, his colleagues, and leveraging his story, realized that he should pivot from socialnet.com to something called PayPal. And then he realized at, when the time was right to pivot from PayPal to something you might know as LinkedIn. Um, Sheryl Sandberg is, a, is the, probably the, the best CEO in the world, in my opinion. Sheryl Sandberg pivoted from all places, from Google to Facebook. So who in, I mean, if you ever want to make some money in the stock market, follow Sheryl Sandberg. Wherever she goes next, you can invest. But the point is, she used her connections and her story to realize when and why she should pivot from one of the most successful companies in the world to one of the fastest, to one of the most highly capitalized companies in the world. Um, Flickr, a Canadian company, they started out as an online gaming platform, as you can imagine. And they realized from interactions with their, with not just their customers, but with, again, with their with their tribe that it was time to pivot from their gaming platform to the, to the, um, to the uh, photo sharing platform. And lastly, Groupon, once heralded as the fastest growing company in the world, they pivoted um, from uh, uh, a do-gooder, basically um, a think tank to what they are today based on interactions, not only in the boardroom and, and within their, and, and, and inside their, their, um, their, um, a labor pool, but within their tribe. So leveraging your story is the best, surest, most profound way you can understand when and where and what you should be doing in the space that you find yourself drawn to or, or, or most attracted to. So um, it is, let me give you some, here, here's some proof in the pudding that pertains specifically to me. Um, in, on this trip alone, I ended up with something like uh, over something like 7,200 followers on social media. I had um, something like 10, tens of thousands of people reading uh, my blog posts a day. And I had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of views, engagements, and interactions. I never set out to do this. All I set out to do was share my story in the most honest way possible. And it was, it's not easy because as you can see, I wrote 450 posts all, of the, all, all, all over the course of some nine months and I did it most, I did it every single time strapped down horizontally to my bunk, typing with my thumbs on a waterproof iPad, usually in the pitch black because I had to do it at night. It was the only time that I wasn't actually sailing the boat. So it was that important to me that I do this, um, that I spent, I, I spent the time I could have been sleeping doing it. And, and I mean, sleep, yes, remember that I'm getting uh, anywhere from two to four hours of sleep, sleep a day, and sleep is something that you desperately need because if you if your sleep patterns are just are are obviously disrupted and you sleep begin to sleep more less and less, your ability to perform goes downhill very quickly, and that's not a good thing when help is thousands of miles away. So it was that important that I it was that important. I felt it was that important to share my and I didn't know why because I didn't, I had no I didn't want to I didn't set out to do this. I set out for other reasons, but um, it was that important that I share my story that, that I spent some very, very precious and very difficult time doing it. You Bert, need- Are you open to a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. What was it like returning to society, let alone in the middle of a pandemic after your time at sea? And this question is from Alex Cronje. Well, returning back um, returning home was was really really difficult. 
Um, number one, I'd been away for a very, very long time. And, and remember, I'm coming back to a world that is completely and utterly changed from the one I left. I and mean, everyone is thinking that when I leave, when, when I come back, I'll be a changed person. No one in their right mind thought that when I would come back, the world itself would be changed on a wholesale level. So um, I was very anxious coming back because it's a world that I didn't, that I, I had, that I was not at all familiar with. I was, um, and uh, the things that were going on were, were very, very strange, very odd, clearly. I mean, and, and um, it was going to be a, a very, very rude and disruptive awakening. And it, firstly, there's, there's the transition from, there's just a normal transition from, from having been alone for so long, not talking to anyone. Um, the only thing that, the only voice that you hear is yours. I had, I had virtually, I, I had voice communication. I had virtually no voice communication. So again, the only voice you hear is your own. And you come back to 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 something entirely different. And one of the things that I'll that I'll say that characterized coming back as being odd is that um, when I'm walking down the street, the first thing I notice is that everybody is moving away from you. It's one of the social distancing rules. You got to stay six feet away from everybody. So before you're walking down the street and there's nobody physically trying to get away from you, obviously physically and purposely trying to get away from you. So it's it makes you feel like you're. <laughs> It makes you feel that there's something literally like you you feel like you're some the, the carrier of some of some plague because people are actively moving away and that is i mean it's one thing to come back to a world and then find as soon as you step foot on land that people are literally running away from you so um there's a bit of a mind game and i can tell you it's 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 not easy and then over and above that um coming back they came back to a a huge, well, to a, in terms of COVID standards and, and, and Canadian standards, a huge, you know, media, um, you know, a, a lot of media. So I was being pulled to every which, every which way. And it's only been in the, actually in the last, like, I'm still doing media. I'm still doing interviews on the talk, still, still doing articles, still doing everything under the sun. So you get pulled every which way. So you just kind of want to crawl in a hole and be yourself, but that's just not possible. There's just, there's, it's just impossible. So it's very hard coming back. Yeah. Another question. Your wife encouraged you through daily conversation. Could you please share one or two things that she said and encouraged you most? Um, I had no communication with my wife on a daily basis. None. That's, I'm not sure where you got that. The only, the only communication I had was um, I had, I had uh, very, very limited ability to, to text people and I had I only had the ability to, um, I had the ability to send email and to send low resolution pictures, but I had no, no ability to actually receive pictures. So I, I wasn't able to, I, I spoke to my wife over the course of those nine months, maybe five times. Um, and then it was over a very, very poor, very clunky, uh, almost impossible to navigate or almost impossible to imagine satellite phone uh, link. So no, I wasn't able to, to speak to my wife. Um, and yes, of course, she was very encouraging, but they were, um, they made the, my, the short team made a conscious effort to, um, they made a conscious effort to, to speak very carefully about what, about how things were going on at home. And um, just so that I wouldn't be any more stressed than I was already. So they were very careful about about stressing me out any further than I than 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 our um, than I already was. Okay. Uh, last question. I'm I'm interpreting. <laughs> uh, how did you arrange for your personal welfare before your journey? Um. Well, I I was I was prepared as. Well, I mean, here, here's an example. Before I left, the three weeks before I left, I fell off the top of the mast. So I actually left with four broken ribs and a partially collapsed lung. So I'm not sure how that actually translates into to leaving, securing your, your, your personal welfare. So about three weeks before I left, I was, I, had, I was installing something at the top of the mast and the line that I was on uh, broke, my safety line broke and I fell some 55 feet to the deck. Uh, which usually is fatal. Um, the doctor that showed up here um, had with him the 
an accidental death certificate that my wife saw looking over his shoulder, which didn't go over too well. Um, but I was, yeah, so I was, I mean, physically I was, I was not in very good shape because I was, I had suffered a pretty traumatic injury. Um, mentally, I felt um, you're never prepared to go because the, the to-do list is, is enormous. There's always a million things to do and you're never quite done. And, uh, but with respect to the boat, I, I had absolute faith and confidence in, in the boat. And I had absolute faith and confidence that I'd be able to figure things out as I went. So I was, I was prepared from a sailing context. I was, I was prepared as best as I could possibly be, even though I was real, even though I was, I, I would say highly inexperienced by, by other standards, I was, I was prepared as best as I could be. So physically I left, um, and that this is what, I mean, it's never perfect. You will, there's nothing in life that you can ever, if you wait until things are perfect, you'll be waiting a very long time. Um, so at some point you just got to stick your head down and say, I'm going to do it. And uh, like I said, I stuck my head down and said I was going to do it. Um, I left the dock with four broken ribs and a partially collapsed lung um, with a to-do list as long as your arm. And uh, I just said, it's just something I'm going to do. I'm going to finish. That's, I just, I left and never once entertained the notion that I was going to stop or not, or, or, or not succeed. So, Thank you, Bert. There's no further questions. All right. So one of the things that you have to do is that you have to recognize, um, you have to recognize, res uh, um, you have to recognize revolution. And what I mean by, by, by revolution is you have to have to recognize when things are, are changing and, and, and when things are changing dramatically, that is when opportunity is at its greatest. And right now we live in one of the greatest marketplace revolutions that the world has ever seen. And one of the greatest entrepreneurial free-for-alls, certainly since, certainly since the, uh, the um, industrial age. And like I said, disruption or revolution is always synonymous with opportunity. And the bigger and more, and more profound and the more expansive the disruption, the greater the opportunity. So um, here, to maybe put this into context, here's one of my favorite quotes. It's by a, uh, it's by a, a naturalist and, a, and an essayist by the name of John Burroughs. And he says, the lure of the distant and difficult is deceptive. The great opportunity is where you are. And there's, there's two contexts in which, in which that is true. One is the four inches between your ears. I mean, that's where you are and it's the only place you could ever possibly be. And the other is where your two feet are right now, the ground that you're standing on. Um, globalization and emerging, and, and, and emerging markets are screaming for technology that we take for, that we take for granted. And, and continued um, privatization on a grand and massive scale represents um, opportunity that that comes along once in many, 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 many generations. And, and right here, right now, and I understand full well that 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 um, coronavirus or, or, or COVID-19 has had devastating impacts on, on many individuals and in many, many sectors of, of the economy. But for others, it's a but for disruptors, it's a dream come true. Like um, it is there are there are people making more money and, and realizing goals and realizing their um, potentials, whether it's, whether it's their own business potential or whether, it's, or whether it's their own personal potential in this time than ever before. As an example, um, um, as an example, when I left group medical visits and telemedicine was unheard of. It was something that was never gonna happen, never in a million years. I know doctors and healthcare professionals that I've worked with for more than 20 years have been on the BC government for just about that length of time trying to get um, telemedicine off the ground and trying to get group medical visits authorized. Well, now the groups, the medical groups and the medical practices and clinics that I'm involved with are, are among Canada's premier um, clinics and premier clinicians. And we're looking the opportunity now for them, like their, their practices are growing at astronomical rates because the government and the drop of a hat decided that group medical visits and telemedicine was a good idea. So group medical visits and telemedicine isn't going anywhere as an example of one of the outcomes of, of COVID-19 and um, has accelerated that sector of the economy in ways that was unheard of even uh, less than a year ago. So we're looking to leverage um, IT solutions, uh, web footprints, or I should say internet footprints, um, automated IT solutions, both locally, provincially, and internationally 
And that opportunity has, has arisen, even though we've been sort of hammering at the door for the last 10 or 15 years, that opportunity has risen because of COVID and has been accelerated because of COVID. And I can think of, I mean, think of Netflix, think of this platform we're on right now. How many people honestly knew what Zoom was say eight months ago? Um, how many people would have thought that this is how we would be meeting? Judy, would you have thought that you'd have people from Russia, Minnesota, and Prince Rupert on your, um, I mean, when, when I was sailing in 2016 and 17, when I was sailing across from Gabriola, it was a big deal. Now I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm your neighbor. I'm, I'm just about parked in your backyard. So, so there are opportunities now as a result of a disruption. And I, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not trying to make light of COVID in any way, shape or form, but I'm, I'm just illustrating the point that disruption is, is opportunity for, for us. So hopefully that's some context for you. And this is step number four. This is the, the root. This is the glue that binds all these things together. And this is what I want to focus on today. And this is the, this is the one, if you take baby steps, you must take baby steps. No matter how daunting, difficult, dangerous, or dubious, or dire your situation might be, you can always and absolutely reduce what must be done right now to the simplest, most basic thing. So let me give you, let me give you an example. On the boat, it is sometimes so difficult to move that putting your boots on takes 20 minutes. Getting outside to do what you know you have to do to literally save the boat from being utterly destroyed means that you've got to risk life and limb getting outside. Well, in order to get outside, it's really, really, really hard because putting your boots on takes sometimes 20 minutes. So I would reduce putting my boots on to the most simplest basic task I must do right now. Sometimes that's unbuckling myself from being strapped down in my bunk. The simple act of just taking my hands, placing them on my seatbelt and opening it up, I would make a physical conscious effort to do that. So I don't care how difficult, how dire, how distressed the situation is, it can always be reduced to the simplest, most basic step that you have to do right now to move yourself forward. And once you take that step, then you take the next and the next and the next and the next. You, you must, if you do that, then you're always moving in a forward direction. You're always improving your circumstance that one tiny step at a time. And there, the, it's, Personally, I believe that this concept of taking massive action is trite. Like, are you going to quit your, let's say you decide to become an entrepreneur, are you going to, you're going to quit your job? Good for you. Are you going to quit your job again tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that? You cannot possibly take massive action on a continuing ongoing basis because there isn't, there isn't, there isn't that opportunity for you to follow that particular path. It turns out that it is the single straw that breaks the camel's back. The journey of a thousand miles begins with but a single step. Um, you need to, it is possible to reduce whatever you have to do, no matter how difficult and dire the circumstance, to the one simple, most basic, fundamental step that you have to do right now to improve your outcomes. That I think is the glue. That's the, that's the most important message that I think I could possibly give to you guys today, the, the single most, the, the, the macro message is something a little bit different, but, um, and there's, you can, you can employ that particular methodology or strategy in any context that you can imagine. So let me give you an example. This is Suburban um, at anchor in Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands. The wind here is about 65 knots. That's about 75 or close to 80. Oh, it's over 75 miles an hour. It's over hurricane strength. And this is before, this picture was taken before it got windy. The waves in the bay are six feet and higher. So two meters plus. And I'm attached to, um, I don't have any of my normal anchoring gear on board because I left it all at home. Um, because I, it's too heavy to bring on the trip. I had no plans on anchoring. I was actually in, this, in Port Stanley avoiding a massive storm with winds 
uh, probably close with gusts well over 100 miles an hour offshore. I couldn't get offshore quick enough, so I was forced into Stanley um, by steering problems and, and, of course, weather. So this is perfectly allowed. Um, you're allowed to anchor. That's still considered underway. So anchoring in Stanley in no way, or anchoring in no way, shape, or form, as long as you don't go ashore, um, affects your not the nonstop nature of the voyage. It's perfectly acceptable. But I had to go outside every 20 minutes for about three days because the little tiny rope that I was attached to, that the anchors were attached to, was chewing its way through the boat. Um, and I had to, every 20 minutes, add a little bit of extra rope. Um, while, it, while this was going on, the boat was slowly dragging ashore. I'm headed for, of all places, a graveyard on the shore in Stanley. So I would be strapped to my bunks on the inside with the wind literally tearing at everything outside, forcing myself to get completely dressed to go stand outside to add two feet of rope. And I had to do this continuously over and over and over again for three days to not just save myself, but to save the boat. And there's no one coming to get you. Even in Stanley, it was so windy that nothing could get off the dock or nothing could move. So like I said, this is this is a this picture was taken by by someone on the shore in a telephoto lens. This is the only picture on the slideshow that's not mine. Clearly that's me on the boat. Um, there's I don't care. You can be, you can be paralyzed with the with fear, with wind literally tearing at the rigging and the sails, and the boat absolutely being hammered and pounded by waves hard enough to sweep everything clear off the deck. And the only thing that comes to mind is that you're alive now. That that's all you think about is that I'm okay now because I'm still alive and I'm still breathing. And there's there's an economic the economists there's there's an equivalent concept for this that applies to large corporations. It's called um, it's called the, oh, it's escaping me right now. It's, uh, oh, it's called activity inertia. So it's, the activity inertia means that large corporations are not agile enough. That they recognize and understand um, disruption and opportunity in the marketplace, but, but they're not agile enough to respond. And what they do, they're not agile enough to respond in the right way. What they do is that they do the same thing. They just do it more, more, more vigorously. It's very much like, um, you running down the road trying trying to avoid a car that's gonna that's coming up behind you is gonna steamroll you and run you over. So instead of taking off at 90 degrees to the direction the car is traveling, you just run faster in the same direction. Um, you're doing the same thing. You're just doing it more vigorously and eventually and certainly the car will run you over. This is exactly what large corporations do. The best run corporations in the world do do this exact same thing. So it's not just it's not just you personally that do it. It happens to everyone. And one of the ways that you can uh, break that cycle is to do what I'm going to, is to do, take, is to take baby steps. So I'm sort of just got a little bit ahead of myself there, but this is what the, the, the tendency for you to think I'm, I'm okay, I'm alive now, I'm going to be doing the same thing, and that's going to work is absolutely, utterly, totally the best way to get yourself steamrolled. And from a soldier's, um, from, from a soldier's perspective, because I, I, I was a, I was a, a captain in, in the Special Service Force, the Canadian Special Service Force, the Airborne, um, the equivalent of Delta Force in the United States. Um, there's something that soldiers do called shoot and scoot. Like you, the first thing you're trained to do as a soldier is you're gonna fire your weapon, is you're gonna, you have to move immediately afterwards. And because as soon as you fire your weapon, everyone knows where you are. And people that play video games, I guess, know this sort of thing, but in real life, it's absolutely true. If you, once you fire your weapon, everyone knows where you are. And if you stay there, you're gonna get shot. But mentally, it's the hardest thing in the world to do is to get up and go somewhere else. Because where you are right now, you're not shot and you, you seem perfectly safe. So why would you leave a perfectly safe space, go do something that you know is inherently dangerous to go to another safe space? Those things just are, dis, are complete disconnects from the human mind. But the way to get around that is to take these baby steps that I talked about consistently. You can reduce whatever you have to do to the simplest, most basic element and then do that and then do the next and the next and the next. And it, as it turns out, um, like I said, it's a single straw that breaks the camel's back. It's bits that lead to bunches, bunches lead, bunches leads to bags, and bags lead to bucketfuls. So um, doing this consistently is the surefire way to succeed. Bert, have you time for a couple of questions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what kind of preparation did you do before embarking on this journey? What prompted you to take up this journey? 
what inspired you and kept you going through even the toughest times? Um, well, there's there's a lot there. Um, but firstly, with 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 preparation, I mean, I I'd, I'd sailed suburban some fifteen thousand miles before I went on this trip, so um, I knew the boat really really well. Uh, physically, I prepared the boat really well, so I did a ton of work on it. Like I know that I disappeared from Rogers network for a couple of years because it took a couple of years to get the boat ready to go, um, including replacing replacing all kinds of things that, that, that I needed that had to be absolutely bomb proof. So um, that was very, very important. But um, in terms of preparation, I, I put myself in those situations on the boat that I knew that I would have to, that I knew would be duplicated when I was away. So I practiced um, all the heavy weather tactics I knew that I that I would that I would be trying to use um, when I was I, I took the, before I went to before I went on this trip I was I went to Alaska again I've been to the Bering Sea for example um, and Lucian Islands but I went back to Alaska to shake out all the different things I had done to the boat to make sure that that all those things were up to snuff um, what the the so I was, I was well prepared. I was, I knew, like I said earlier, I knew that I had done enough and practiced enough on the boat that I knew um, that I had a, a series of strategies that I could fall back on um, when things got really, really hard. And so I had a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, D, E, and F, and G. You, I'm, I was always trying to be one step ahead of everything. So that's just, if you don't, if you get behind the boat or behind the weather, then you're done for. There, there's there's no hope for you. It's just the boat is too big. This the weather is too mean. The waves are too nasty. There's no way that you can get behind. So you need you know and it's, you need to be able to scrub those plans and move quickly to something else. Which is the which is why you take small baby steps. Um, it is uh, um, then in in with regards to to to, to motivation. Um, like I said, I never left. I never for once entertained the thought that I wasn't going to succeed or, the, or that I was going to turn around. And what is surprising for motivation is that I found that the people who were connecting with me, and I, 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 I had no access to social media. I haven't read any of the social media comments or anything like that at all. I just, I would get snippets um, from by email. And by snippets, I mean maybe one or two or three, perhaps a week from the shore team. And realizing that there were so many people um, engaged and following and and sincerely hoping and wishing that the, the voyage turned out well was unbelievably inspiring. Um, so and and I I knew and I, I'm I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, but one of the things one of the things that prompted this trip actually was was my attendance at one of uh, Roger's beautifully orchestrated TED talks, and during that TED talk. Um, I, and prior to that, I had given a talk to the VBN group about, about extraordinary and how important I think living or becoming extraordinary is. And my context of extraordinary is, I'm sure, is, is not, I can guarantee you, is, is, is not what you think it is. So sitting there listening to Ted, to one of, to, to one of some of those TED talks at Roger's invite, um, I was, I, I realized I wanted to put my money where my mouth was in a very, very big way. So um, one of the inspirations in, and one of the inspirations was for this trip lies in, in sitting in the listening to um, listening to some of the TED talks again that, that Roger had put on in Vancouver. And I'm and I'm, I haven't said this to Roger, I never said this. Roger doesn't know this. I one of the things that I wanted to do was not let down the people who I know who I knew would be um, in my corner, so to speak. I, I never wanted to let down my family. I never wanted to let down those people that I respect and who had a had a had a, a large part to play in the in the trip, whether they knew it or not. And one of the persons I didn't want to let down was Roger. So, so I would sit there. I mean, literally, I would pick myself up out of the out of the cabin and go do what I had to go do because there's no way in the world I could ever come back and face those people um, that I really cared about or or that had inspired me or I felt I owed something to. So. Um, you'll find that when you connect deeply and honestly with your with your with your story that you'll find that that particular feedback is really really empowering and, and can't possibly be uh, be ignored so um i could i could talk a lot more about motivation and uh, there's other other external motivators there's things i had particular goals within this goal itself but i don't want to really i think that's going to be um moving us a little bit away from what i want to go what i want to say so is that does that answer your question is that is that going to suffice for now
Yeah, there's a, another question. Uh, I'll ask it. It might be a little off topic. Uh, AI and data technology has changed our world. Recently, in a Netflix documentary called Social Dilemma, some tech experts who contributed to this tech revolution speak about the ad adverse effects of the AI technology. How do you see the next trend? Well, um, like like all things, uh, AI, you know, technology and, and AI is a tool. It's that, that's all it is. Social media is a tool, and um, tools can be used um, poorly for any in, in any in any number of ways. So, um, I mean, I don't see for 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 one. I I mean the the well, I guess I I mean there's so many different context in which this could go it's hard to say I mean uh, I I would think that I, I think I'll just I think I'll just leave it at that I think you know, AI AIs you know the, the the next the next trends we see in technology as they pertain to to as they pertain to say that something like the circumnavigation or, or pertain to to your to your own business is um, you got to remember always that it's just a tool it's not the be all end all you know AI isn't gonna isn't gonna save you from anything at all all it's going to do is either enable or disable you and how and in what context or how that happens and, and in what context is entirely up to you. Um, and if you don't, if you're not reading, if you're not reading enough um, and you're not, and you're not, not finding yourself um, properly contextualized, then you're probably going to end up on the wrong side of that equation. So. Bert, uh, this is a five minute warning. Yeah, yeah. And just so about... if we could just uh, move on and then yeah. anybody who wants to stay on afterwards, then we can proceed with further questions. Sure, so here's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm only a few minutes away. So um, here's, here's how all this works together. Um, this is a positive feedback loop. These four steps are a positive feedback loop. And you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be synchronous, but, and they, and you can be stuck in one for a very long time. But, if you read more, if you read more, that will allow you to contextualize your own experiences and your own story. And what I mean by contextualize means you to properly place yourself in your in in, a, in 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 space and time, literally where your two feet are in the ground, and how opportunity um, and how opportunity presents itself. It will allow you then to and if you're leveraging your story and you're properly contextualized, you will recognize when there's revolution around you. You will recognize disruptions for what they are. And if you take baby steps and move forward and carefully and del deliberately despite the risks involved, then you're gonna be constantly moving forward in the direction that you need to go to realize your goals. And the longer you do this, the more you maximize your potential or the more you, the farther you can extend your reach. And if you do this say for nine months, you can sail around the world at literally a snail's pace. So this process, this process of reading, contextualizing, sharing your story, understanding where you are, and then taking small steps is brain dead simple. We can all read, we can all share, and we can all look around and recognize for what's going on around us. I mean, that's all you have to do is open your eyes, like literally put your phone down and look up, look out the window. And we can all take baby steps. We can't all take massive action. We can't all quit our jobs. We can't all um, we can't all perform a miracle today, but I guarantee you that if you take small baby steps over a great over any length of time, you will find yourself in a place that is literally a miracle away from where you started. And I, I don't remember, perhaps maybe Roger might remember this or maybe Judy, but there are some fantastic and very, very eloquent stories that speak to this. And my favorite is, of course, is Mother Teresa. I'm not saying that you need to be Mother Teresa or in any way, shape, or form I am. What I'm saying is that if you take these small steps, that is where you will get. So this is the positive feedback loop I'm talking about. Success begets success. Winners beget winners. And losers beget lessons if you're properly contextualized. So I think that this particular, this little, this loop that I'm showing you here, this little, this, this, this metaphor for change is the most powerful thing that I know of. It is the simplest thing that I know of, and you can do this under the most dire, most extreme, most distressing circumstances that you can possibly imagine. And I can assure you that I can I can say this with 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 some authority because what I was able to do is something that almost no one on the planet has been able to do. And this is exactly how I did it. And this is exactly how I did it when I was in the army. This is exactly how I did it when I was making millions with a software development company. This is, and when I stepped away from this, 
when I when my head was bigger, much bigger, it's, then I would make losers didn't beget lessons, losers beget losers. So um, I think that this 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 disruptor ethos, what I've described here, this small feedback loop, the small steps that you can take immediately and you can do every single day and they cost you absolutely nothing except for maybe a Kindle book here and there. Or you can go to the Gutenberg library and get everything you need to possibly read for free. So it, this is completely and totally free. I think this is the most powerful metaphor change that you could possibly incorporate um, in your life today. So um, let me talk very briefly about failures and successes before I move on. You will fail. I mean, everyone, you should never, ever, ever be afraid of failure. They are the foundation of success. You need to revel in your mistakes and your flaws. You need to um, enjoy your missteps and miscalculations. Chances are you'll only ever make them once. So enjoy them and then move on. And success lies in being extraordinary and not extraordinary in the grand context, but extraordinary in the, I'm going to take a small, tiny wee step forward now, because if I stay where I am, that is simply ordinary. But if I take a little tiny step, an extra step, that is by definition extraordinary. So success lies forever beyond the reach of the ordinary. And I think that no matter where you look, no matter how you look, Malcolm, um, you know, the, the, the 10,000 hour rule, those things are all embodied in being just a little bit different than ordinary. And um, one of my favorite quotes by Carl Jung is that mistakes are after all the foundations of truth. And if a man does not know what a thing is, it is at least an increase in knowledge, knowing what is not. So I think that of all the messages, besides the positive feedback loop, that this one thing by Carl Jung, and Carl Jung is pretty smart. I mean, if you can't believe him, I'm not sure who you can believe. So what Carl Jung is talking about here is taking a baby step and it might, may or may not be in the right direction. But if you take action now, and I'm a firm believer in taking action early, even though it might be a very tiny step, you're gonna look like a genius. Because if you are wrong, you find out before the herd and can make a better decision in front of, in front of it. And if you are right, you're gonna look like a genius because you're one step of everybody already. So there is absolutely no downside to taking a very tiny step right or wrong now and right or wrong circumstance will very quickly sort you out whether you are right or wrong so um lastly and on a personal admonition i encourage everyone to work hard and play harder um and this is a picture of me thrashing my way home from hawaii and uh i can tell you that doing this for six thousand miles anybody who's been on a sailboat going up wind for six thousand miles like this is about as much fun as sticking needles in your eye so this is my definition of playing harder and thank you note, so I much want, bert i want to say thank you there you are so uh there's some contact information um i want to thank you i want to thank roger and judy um again for the tremendous opportunity to speak to you guys it's a real privilege and an honor and uh i hope i've been able to um, very briefly give you some insight into what it takes to do something that is beyond beyond almost imagining for for most of the people that walk this earth and I can I can assure you that I'm not I'm not superhuman in any shape or any way shape or form I'm just persistent and I know how to take small tiny wee steps <laughs>